Welcome to Game Changers with Molly Fletcher, where we take you behind the scenes with peak performers to learn what makes them tick and discover how you can apply their lessons to your life. I'm your host, Molly Fletcher. Professional magician, NFL player, motivational speaker, and soon to be author. It's safe to say that today's guest, John Dorenboss, has a lot of tricks up his sleeve. John played 14 seasons in the NFL, the majority with the Philadelphia Eagles, before his career ended in 2017 by a life threatening heart condition. He competed on the TV show America's Got Talent, where he showcased his skills as a magician and made it to the finals. He's gone on to appear on Ellen and the Today Show. But his story is so much more than that. It's one of family tragedy, perseverance, accountability, and forgiveness. On today's episode, John shares his incredible life story and how he's been able to use his platform as a professional athlete and skills as a magician to connect with people. We talk about overcoming obstacles, embracing change, and showing up with a positive outlook no matter the circumstances. His new book titled Life is Magic is coming out soon. This is truly an amazing story. Here's my conversation with John Dorenboss. So, John, it is such a pleasure to have you on. You know, for folks that don't know, your life was uprooted at a really early age. And can you just tell our listeners and, 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 and me that story of what happened and the impact that it had on you and, and, and your life? You know, my dad was my best friend. And uh, he was the president of Little League. We played catch every single day. And uh, he, was, he was my guy. And my mom started a reading program at the elementary school I went to. And everybody loved her. And uh, I came home. When I was 12 years old, I came home from a baseball camp and found that my dad had murdered my mother and wasn't pretty. And so my sister and I went into temporary foster care for uh, about a year, a little over a year. And uh, my aunt, who was my mom's sister, uh, got full custody of us after that year, year and a half. And so my sister and I then moved back down or moved down to Southern California and the world started over. So my sister and I, for about the, the year and a half, we were in the temporary foster home. Uh, we went through the most intense therapy you could possibly imagine and sat through the trial, um, saw the autopsy photos, and we were immersed in the process. And some people thought it was crazy, but at the same time, you know, I'm 38 years old, and I'm one of the happiest people I've ever met because mm-hmm. of the foundation that that therapy gave me and the things that I learned and uh, the things I saw and the way I was able, uh, the people around me that helped me process everything. So, uh, And here we are today. And so what were some of the things that you learned being that immersed in it at, at such a young age? Have forgiveness in your life and realize mm-hmm. that people aren't mm-hmm. perfect. Mm-hmm. Realize that the world doesn't really care, right? The world's not out here to accommodate any of us. Things happen. The sooner we can become okay with that, and the sooner that we can uh, be okay with our past, the sooner that I learned not to be embarrassed about where I come from, instead realize that, you know, everybody else has their problems too. And we're not alone. You know, there's times where there's things that have happened to myself. There's things that happen to other people where they feel like they're alone. So they isolate themselves and then they go into this depression and they they just don't know how to talk about it because they're embarrassed. There's nothing to be embarrassed about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Everybody's got their issues. Mm -hmm. And the sooner I realized that, the sooner that it was okay to talk about things, the sooner that I realized um, to have closure in my life with things, whether it's materialistic uh, uh, events, uh, people, um, people come and go in our lives and take what you can and, and and from an emotional level, from an inspirational level. And for whatever reason, whether those people pass on or they just choose a different path, that's life and be okay with that. And that's helped me in my life. Yeah, no question. Well, and, and magic became an escape for you, which is just so fun. And I have to say out loud, right? You and I spoke at an event together and you were right before me and I was watching these magic tricks, and I mean, they're not just sort of little magic tricks. I mean, for a guy who is a professional athlete to be doing magic tricks like you do, uh, I mean, they're unbelievable. They are unbelievable oh, what you do. Thanks. They're awesome. So how, how did you get into magic, and, and why did it appeal to you so much? 
So after the year and a half in the foster home, my sister and I came down to Southern California, and I immediately went back up uh, to, I, I was living in Woodenville, Washington at the time, which was just outside of Seattle. And I stayed with a baseball coach. I made the Little League All-Star team, and so I went back up playing, and his neighbor was a 16-year-old named Michael Groves who did magic. And so he came over and he did a, a show for us. And I actually had the entire show on a VHS tape because the coach at the time, uh, Coach Schmidt, recorded the whole thing. So what's really cool is I actually had the footage of me seeing a trick for the first time, which is really cool. And oh, especially cool. growing up in our era, as you know, we didn't have cameras like cell phones today. Where you right. Record our entire <laughs> right. Life. Sure. You know, you actually have to get out the big camera and the VHS tape, plug it in. So it was a process. Yeah. Oh, you're making me feel old, man. Me too. Yeah, and, no. Uh, I'm, you know, so yeah. um, I loved it. I loved everything about it. And I loved the way it made me feel at 12 years old. And I specifically remember I didn't think about anything else except the moment. And it was probably the only thing at that time in my life where I wasn't thinking about all the stuff going on in my life, the change, um, losing both my parents. I was just in that moment of fun, of being a kid. Mm -hmm. And so I got obsessed with it. So I got some books. And when I say I got obsessed with it, I became obsessed with the idea of learning something, a, a tedious motion, doing the same thing over and over and over in search of the perfect rep, right? In search of that perfect time. And all of a sudden, I got really good. And I, I didn't do tricks for years. Like I just kind of just worked on it myself. And then when I kind of came out, all of a sudden it was like, whoa, this guy's been, this guy's been practicing. So I love cards. I love everything about cards. Um, I love the idea of shuffling, which, uh, at the gig that we were at, I did a whole thing on yeah. what I call slop shuffle, which is face up, face down. And, um, and, and I could take those things anywhere and wherever I went, if I shuffled, I was at ease. And, you know, people ask me all the time, what's your favorite sound in sports, the two helmets cracking or, um, you know, a golf swing, a basketball hoop, a bat hitting a ball. Uh, no, it's it's the sound of of cards shuffling. Wow. And to me, that is cool. Mm -hmm. Well, I know, and I saw you do that. You on the Ellen DeGeneres show, you've done that trick with her, which is cool. So, when did football come into play in your life? I didn't start football until high school, and I'm I'm really glad about that for for a couple of different reasons. So. When I got to high school, a buddy of mine came and said, hey, you should play football. And at the time, I was a baseball guy. And I was like, no, nah, I'm good. And he literally said this, but you can hit that guy and not get in trouble. Okay, yeah, I'm in. Let's go. <laughs> so um, my freshman year, it was great. So it kind of just happened, right? All of a sudden, during the day, I could get out all my aggression, everything. Mm. And then at night, I would go home and I would light a candle. And no joke, I would listen to a Yanni CD because uh, we didn't have very many CDs. So it was either Yanni or John Cicada. Sorry, Sakata, but I picked Yanni. And I would sit down at the table and shuffle. So I had this balance, right? And I learned this extreme balance at a young age that go out, get out your aggression, be a man, alpha, hit, gladiator, awesome. And then go home and just chill out and relax and shuffle cards. Wow. Right, right, right. Two totally different things inside of the same day at such a young age. That's pretty mature. Did you recognize what those were both doing for you in that moment too? Did you feel that? Did you see that? Did you just know it made you feel better? You know, I, I didn't. And I didn't recognize it or realize it until I got into speaking, until I started to actually talk about my life mm -hmm. in, in, in a concept of storytelling. And it dawned on me that, holy cow, I had this balance and look what it did for me. Amazing. And I think I had longevity in football because of it. Because when the season was over, uh, that's I left. I'm out. Like I don't think about football. I don't talk about it. I, I, I just I go perform and I go shuffle cards and I toured the country and I had this extreme balance of you know being a gladiator for half the year and being able to perform half the year. And you were long snapper, um, which is a position that's so critical in football. But you know, people and long snappers don't get a lot of credit, right? you know, kind of the only time the announcers want to call your name is when you, when you make a mistake, right? I, at least that's sort of how, how I seem to see it sometimes. How did that role suit you so well? I mean, you're a great athlete, right? And, and you were playing this long snapper role. You know, some of the best compliments I ever got. So, uh, when my career came to an end, teammates were coming out doing interviews and, um, there was a comment that was kind of consistent and I loved it. And it was the biggest honor probably coming from a teammate, uh, guys like Brent Selleck and, and all these other players said, hey, I'll tell you what, if there was a pressure situation, there's nobody else we wanted out there but Dornboss. That guy's got ice in his veins. Wow. And I kind of reflected on that, and I said, man, what a compliment, right? And so for me, the more pressure there is on a performance or a game, the better I play. I play so much better under pressure because, I don't know, maybe the moment matters. It's, 
it's it's but but then again when i was a kid i learned magic right so to, and for me my reading comprehension is really really bad and it's one of the reasons that my mom started this reading program in the elementary schools because i really struggled reading comprehension so now all of a sudden i get into magic and magic books back then you know we're talking about the early 90s they were written for all right-handed magicians well i'm left-handed so not only is my reading comprehension bad but now every time i see the word right i need to tell myself left every second so i would go through these books and cross out i wouldn't even read it i would just go through and look for the words right and left and and, and cross them out and like write and pencil over it but then i learned that these moves right they're really really hard but if i just stick to it i'll get it if i just have patience and i enjoy the process right it's enjoying the process and the difficulty to get to that goal well then all of a sudden you know sports happen i find my niche is a long snapper well long snapping is the same thing as magic it's doing the same thing over and over and over again mm-hmm. in search of the perfect rep that when it comes down to it, when it's game time, you got one shot. And when you're performing in front of a crowd, you got one shot. Right. So that pressure, that idea of, of having one shot, do or die. I love that. Um, I, I, that's the part of the game I miss. I, I miss, you know, having two seconds on the clock in Buffalo and it's pouring rain or snow and it's, there's a side wind and, you know, I got to put a, a field goal snap right on the money with the laces out. And, and that, that pressure is, is what I love. Oh, that's awesome. And to see that connection between the world wouldn't think being a long snapper and being a magician have a whole lot to do with each other, but the way you described it makes perfect sense. Again, you know, you asked me, uh, when did I realize just the balance part and, and having the shuffling and, and the football? See, I didn't realize any of this until I made it to the NFL and all of a sudden everybody's asking. And one of the top questions was, Hey, John, tell me, what's the similarities between magic and snapping? And at first, early in my career, I was like, "Um, I don't know, people watch both, (laughs) you know? (laughs) Uh And then it's one of those things that you're driving a car, you're sitting at the house, and you start thinking about it. And then you start breaking it down on what makes a good magician and what makes a good snapper. And I started realizing that these are traits that I had learned as a kid for a long, long time. And, And here's the other thing I learned, right? The process, practice dedication, passion, all these things that is, in my opinion, what it takes to be great. But what it does is it, it builds character. It builds resiliency. Sure. You know, so, so every time that I would work on a card move or drop a coin, it wasn't about not being able to get it. It wasn't about getting frustrated. Every time I picked it up to try again, I built character. That built resiliency. And in football, it's the same thing. You know, you practice and practice and practice year round so that when the moment comes, maybe things don't go your way. But you realize every time that you messed up along the way and every time you stood up, hurt, sick, injured, broken bones, torn ligaments, six hernias, I played through all this stuff. It's a lot harder to give up on yourself when you got so much invested. When you give in so much day after day after day. Yeah. Which you did. Every day. Well, and it's amazing, John. You played for 14 seasons, which in the NFL is insane, right? That is a lifetime in the NFL. Tell me a little bit more about your experience. I mean, I'm imagining you as an athlete on the field, and then you'd go, I mean, I just know from my days as a sports agent, what that locker room, what that clubhouse is like for guys. Were you in there doing magic tricks for these guys all the time and them going, dude, you're pretty good at this. Like, you're good. It's funny, because when I got in the NFL, uh, I got picked up by the Buffalo Bills as a free agent in 2003. And one of my favorite players was on that team. And I'd watched him when I lived in Seattle. And now I was playing with him, and, and that's a quarterback named Drew Bledsoe. And ironically, uh, Drew Bledsoe came up to me in the locker room and said, hey, you're the magic guy, huh? I said, yeah, man, what's going on? He goes, I, I remember you. And when he was at Washington State, my dad's trial was on TV up in that area. And he goes, I remember your dad's trial. Hey, kid, I'm so happy for you. You made it. He put his arm around me and said, whatever you need, I got you. And to this wow. day, Drew and I have been great, great friends. But I looked at Drew in the locker room, and I looked at the other guys, and I noticed that Drew was a lot older than a lot of the other guys. And you know what that means? People said, hey, John, what was your goal when you played? In 2003, you know, most people would say, win a Super Bowl. No, nah, that, that wasn't my sole goal. Uh, to go to the Pro Bowl. No, nah, that wasn't my sole goal. You know what my goal was? What? My goal was to be like Drew. And to be like Drew, man, I want to be the oldest guy on the team. I want to be the oldest guy on the team because if I do that, then that's going to give me – the best chance for success, the most opportunities to win, and a chance to win more than just a Super Bowl. So my goal my entire career was to be the oldest guy on the team for as long as I possibly could. And that meant showing up every day. It meant being a true pro. It meant when you mess up, you take accountability and responsibility, get in front of the media, and you say, my bad. You don't point fingers. Instead, you pick your teammate up, you rally, and you create this self-worth that your teammates, they don't ever want to lose you. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, every opponent fears going against you. 
Well, to me, that's what it meant to be a true pro. It means you show up every day and you do your job, no excuses. And so I remember in 2000, oh man, I think 2000, maybe 13 or 12, 13 or 14, I finally was the oldest guy on the team. I was 36 years old and uh, I looked around, I looked on the roster and I was the oldest guy on the team for about two weeks. And then we signed punter Donnie Jones, who was two weeks older than me. And I said, no, Dang. no, <laughs> don't sign him. I know. Don't sign him coach. Don't sign him. Right. You know, and, and one of the things that I never anticipated happening, I, I never was in the game to break records or anything, but ironically, you know, ever since uh, I lost my parents, I always wanted to, to bring pride to my name. I always wanted people to look at the last name Dornbos and remember something better than what happened. And I always took great pride in people that took a chance on me. Look, I know the reality is, I'm pretty much a slow, pudgy white guy. I get it. <laughs> I get it. And I'm undersized. And there are coaches that took a chance on me and that believed in me. And that to me means more than anything. And mm-hmm. so sure enough, 2017, I was running out uh, against the Redskins. And all of a sudden, over the uh, intercom of the stadium, the announcer said, ladies and gentlemen, we want to congratulate John Dornboss on becoming, for having the record of most consecutive games ever played as an Eagle. 162, right? Yeah, 162. And I said, holy cow. I showed up every single day. Wow. And, uh, you know, the wow. greatest compliment you can get from a teammate is do your job. And they give you what's called a head nod and a little butt slap, right? And and that's respect. So, um, you know, I remember uh, there there were instances I had torn ligaments in my ankle. Doctor said, hey, wait. I looked at Andy Reid and I said, hey, I'm going unless you tell me otherwise. And I played through it. I played through a broken bone. I played through a broken finger. I played through six hernias. And there were moments where players would come up to me. Because as you know, as a sports agent, there's a lot of players that are on the bubble. And what that means is you can get cut any day, sure. right? Sure. And when a guy, and, and all of a sudden you start looking around and, and you're at an age now where people have families and kids and wives. And like when they get cut, it's a big hassle. You're taking kids out of school. It's just, it's a lot. Oh yeah. And I always told myself, no teammates getting fired because of me. It ain't happening. And I played through those injuries for my buddies. I didn't want them to get fired. Mm-hmm. And I loved it because after games that I would play hurt, those guys would come up to me and shake my hand, give me a hug, say, hey, thanks, man. Because they know that had we brought in another long snapper to fill in for me, we needed to clear a roster spot. That they were maybe one of those guys that would have got cut. So I, I took great pride in that. I, I took great pride in my job. I took great pride in uh, the people that, you know, it, it wasn't so much for me. It was taking pride. And, and I always wanted Coach Reed, Jeff Lurie, Greg Williams, and Danny Smith, all, all these coaches that gave me a shot. I always wanted them to look back. You know, the general manager, Tom Donahoe, I want them to look back and say, you know what? I wouldn't want anybody else out there but going boss. That to me is, is unbelievable. That's, that's the greatest compliment you can have that when it's all said and done, they're proud of the decision they made and they're proud that they took a chance on me. Well, gosh, I mean, well, I know they are, and that was evident, and we'll get to that a little bit when the Eagles won the Super Bowl, but your, your commitment, it sounds like you led through clearly your behavior, but also I would imagine through your words. Yeah, I mean, you, you got to have the mindset. You know, first of all, if, if you want to be truly great at something, you got to have the mindset to do it. But then the ultimate thing is you got to deliver, right? I mean, the bottom line is you have to do your job execute. and you have to come through. So you have to execute. Sure. And if you don't execute, well, then it all's for nothing. So, but like we talked about earlier, it was, it was all of a sudden finding love in the process. It was mm-hmm. all of a sudden finding love in the struggles, finding love in the failures. And being able to come back from those and being able to, to overcome those and then to, to slowly improve every little bit of your technique or your life. And then when the time comes, you're like, boom, you're ready. Mm-hmm. You know, great advice that a coach gave me in junior college. Uh, he said, hey, don't worry about what you can't control. Yeah. I said, well, what do you mean? He goes, well, if that school's going to offer you a scholarship, can you control that? I go, yeah, I can. He goes, no, you can't. You don't, they might not even have any scholarships available. I go, oh, good point. He said, so just control what you can control. And guess what? If an opportunity comes, you'll be ready. Mm-hmm. But I'll tell you what, shame on you if an opportunity comes and you weren't ready for it. Right. That's your fault, not theirs. Yep, yep, yep. So understand what we don't know, what we don't know, and just control the things you can control. And life, you know what? This is this is true, too. Life always has a way of working itself out. It does. Well, and, and your behavior helped your life work out and your mindset and, and is, is, is absolutely remarkable. How did you deal with, with constant change, right? I mean, being an athlete you deal with a lot of change physically, mentally, emotionally, uncertainty that comes with being in the league. Can you explain kind of what that's like for our listeners and how you dealt with it? It's a pretty deep question. And and it's a pretty deep question because it goes much further back than probably people would expect. But, you know, when I was in therapy, it was all about change. It was all about coming to terms with your reality. It was all about forgiving those in your past. It was all about 
being okay with, with a part of your life closing and another part starting. And so at a young age, I had a lot of change over a couple of years. That was really, really drastic. And if I didn't like it, if I didn't agree with it, I wouldn't have survived it. And so all of a sudden I became okay with change. I became okay with extreme change overnight. And I, I don't know how else to say this, except looking back on it is you end up loving that part of life and you end up understanding that whether you agree with it or not, life is going to happen and you better be okay with it because there ain't nothing you can do about it. (laughs) And so that's just the way I've been and, and bouncing around. I've always found excitement, I guess, in, in moving in new places. I mean, you know, I look back, I, I mean, most people are like, oh yeah, where have you lived? Oh, I've lived here and here. Wow. I mean, I've lived, I was born in Houston, then we went to Northern California, then Seattle, then Southern California, then El Paso, then Buffalo, then Tennessee, then Philly, then Northern California, then Southern California. Like, I'm a nomad. And right. you know what? I love it because everywhere I went, I got to meet new people. I just did an event with Terry Crews. And, and let me tell you, he said something that like literally resonated with me. It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter how much you succeed. You still meet people that just blow your mind. Sure. And Terry Crews, he just said this. He goes, John, you know why you did great on America's Got Talent? I go, uh, I don't know why. You can't fake loving people, man. Oh, wow. Yeah. And I yeah. was like, whoa. He goes, you do interviews, man. We see it. You know, some people, they just don't like people. Mm-hmm. You can't fake it. Yeah, no, I can attest to that when I was with you. No question. You do. You do. And I do. Yeah, you do. And it shows. It shows so authentically. It, it, it really does. Who's someone you played for or, or, or played with who really had a tremendous impact on you and why? Well, I mean, you're, <laughs> that's, that's going to be a long list. Um, you know, one coach that, uh, unfortunately, he passed away a couple years ago. His name was Coach Hay. And I was playing at Golden West Junior College. And uh, I loved everything about him. I, I loved every, every time he opened his mouth, every time he said something, man, it just hit me. And uh, he, he was another guy that asked, why do we play this game? And well, to win, coach. No, no, we don't play to win. Wait, what? What do you mean we don't play to win? Yeah, we do. That's the only reason we play. Because mm-hmm. if you win, you're, you know, everybody loves you. And if you lose, everybody hates you. Excuse me, everybody hates you. And he said, actually, no. And I go, whoa. He goes, you play for the respect of your teammates. You play for the respect of your opponent. If you become a teammate that your teammate loves and that your teammates would hate to lose and every opponent feared, you're going to win more than you lose. It's about putting yourself in a position to be successful, to have the most opportunities to win. You do that, and you're going to win in life a lot more than you're going to lose. Mm, and I said, whoa. Awesome. Oh, it's amazing. That's good stuff. Yeah, and, and to play with guys like Drew Bledsoe and, and even Drew Brees, you know. So uh, my story is I, I was uh, 14 years in the NFL, and I had just signed a three-year extension. So I was 37 years old. I signed a three-year extension for, for great money and great guaranteed money. And I'm sitting here going, man, I'm going to play till I'm 40 years old. This is amazing. Mm-hmm. So sure enough, the Eagles, uh, they traded me to the New Orleans Saints, which was a shock. I wasn't expecting it. Sure. And, and you want to talk about the magic of life. Um, there was a coach there that basically just said, hey, I want to keep this younger guy. Your road's done. Um, and I said, wow, o- okay. And uh, then the owner, Jeff Lurie, calls me and says, hey, if you want to be an Eagle for one more year, then you can play here and retire. And I remember saying, you know what, Jeff? My whole life has been about change. I tell you what, give me a hug. Let's shake hands. Let's tell each other thank you. And for whatever reason, life has a plan. And, you know, I don't want to be the guy that's here that a coach doesn't want. I don't want to be that part of that dysfunctionality. If that's the guy he wants, he's a great player. Take him. I'll be good. And uh, we'll, we'll talk soon. And so sure enough, I went down to New Orleans. It took a physical. And in my entrance physical, they discovered that I had a, an aneurysm the size of a Coke can in my ascending aorta. And it required emergency open heart surgery. And every time I had been stepping on the field, I had a much higher risk of dying than living. And so uh, if an aneurysm pops like a water balloon, it's basically the vein in your heart, right? It gets so big that it's about to pop like mm-hmm. a water balloon. Right. If that pops, you're dead. Right. You know, it was one of those things. I look back and I was, I was, you know, sitting next to Drew Brees when it happened. And, and I got the news and uh, Thomas Morstead. And um, uh, I, I just remember looking back on, hey, man, had, I, had my ego got involved, right? Had I wanted to prove something to the one coach that didn't really want me there anymore, there's a good chance I would have died. Wow. But instead, I just embraced change, which I'd done my whole life. Sure. I just said, you know what? How can I be angry at an organization that gave me 12 amazing years in the memories just because they're done with me? No, that's, that's life. Change is life. It's okay. Mm-hmm. So just say thank you. Let's move on our way. And, and a lot of people, when they get released, they get bitter, right? Sure. Oh, yeah. How can they get rid of me? I'm the best. Well, sometimes it's not about that. Sometimes getting fired, 
sometimes all these things that happen, that they're not about how good you are. There's corporate America, right? There's things that they have to get done. There's salary cap. There's a lot more into a decision to get rid of somebody than just how good you are. So understand that and just chill out. And I took my own advice. Mm-hmm. And sure enough, it led me to the New Orleans Saints. And whether you're religious or spiritual, are you kidding me? I was traded to New Orleans, and my life was saved by a saint. Right. I know. I love it when you say that. Totally. Sure. It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. Yeah. And and so one minute you're a Change professional. Change is good. Change is good. And we hear that all the time on you know, on calls before keynotes, and I'm sure you do too. I know you speak a lot. It is is change is something that organizations all over are, are dealing with, and I think your advice here is is really helpful. And again, I, I hope people understand where I'm going with this. But every time something really bad happened in my life, something came out of it. But I made the decision to go and look down that road. I made the decision to uh, to see that good can come out of it. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I truly believe that the story you tell yourself, the narrative that you tell yourself, that's your life. No question. How you look at yourself in the mirror and how, how you feel about how you talk to yourself, that's going to be the person you are in this world. And, um, you know, it's, it's about believing in yourself, you know? So, so if somebody asked me, they're like, John, you, you know, you're voted one of the most accurate snappers in, in the NFL and uh, you had accolades. Like, how did you do it? You know what the reality is? This is true. I always wanted to be a rock star, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, I thought being an actor would be amazing, like being movies, what storytelling, have fun. Mm-hmm. So every game, I literally pretended and I played the role of the biggest badass long snapper in the world. He's the best in the world. And I told myself that narrative. I told myself that story. And when I would go on the field, I was an actor playing the role of the best long snapper in the world. And that's what I told myself. Wow. And sure enough, guess what? You start acting like it. Yep. And you start doing it. And yeah. You start, yep. You start doing it and you start believing it. No question. And you become it. No question. No question. That messaging is so, so powerful. So powerful. Here's another gold nugget. So there's a, a speaker and uh, his name's Kevin Elko. And he's had a profound impact on my speaking life, on my personal life. And, uh, I, he, you know, early in my career, he's like, so what do you tell yourself before you snap? Oh, easy, man. I just tell myself, don't screw it up. He goes, well, that's, why would you tell yourself that? Well, it's pretty easy. I don't want to screw up. <laughs> uh-huh. And he goes, but that's just negative reinforcement. Right. Why even use the word screw up? You're telling yourself, don't screw up, don't screw up, screw up. So in the back of your mind, you're worried about screwing up. Just go in there and tell yourself to fire it in there. That's all you got to tell yourself. So from that day on, that's what I told myself. Mm-hmm. That I was an actor playing that role, and I just told myself, fire it in there. And all of a sudden, changing just a few words in the mental approach changed a lot as well. All that negative reinforcement. You know, anytime you say, don't screw up, don't lose, don't screw up, don't lose. You're just reinforcing the negative. No question. Instead, go out there and say, I got this. Fire it in there. You got this. When I played tennis, John, if I stepped up on the, you know, to to serve and thought, oh my gosh, don't double fault. Guess what happened? (laughs) Right? I mean, you had to say, I'm going to smoke it down the middle. Yep. So, you know, one minute you're a a professional athlete and then the next you're fighting for your life, right? So you started to tell that story, which is, which is remarkable. You're saved by a saint, literally. So tell us a little bit about that experience, the surgery, the recovery, physically, mentally, all that. Yeah, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back to 2006. I just signed with the Eagles in November. Uh, Jeff Garcia and I, I, I believe it was both of our first games. And so I was walking out to the game and a reporter named Joe Sancluido stopped me and said, hey, man, uh, welcome to Philly. I, I think it's amazing. Um, didn't your mom sing Wind Beneath My Wings at her funeral? <laughs> I was like, whoa, I <laughs> did, did not expect <laughs> that, right? And I said, yeah, yeah. And I go, thanks, man. Cool. I got to go play a game. He goes, no, don't you see it? And he goes, the the words of the song, I can fly higher than an eagle because you are the wind beneath my wings. Guess what, kid? You bounced around. You've been cut by a couple teams. Didn't get a college scholarship. You had to kind of finagle your way into it. Now you're an eagle and the wind's beneath your wings. You're going to do great things here, kid. We're rooting for you. And so that stuck with me. So now years and years later, I get traded to the Saints and I find out the news. I go talk to the trainers. And as I walk back to my locker, like I said, I walked by a guy named Drew Brees. And I looked at him and he was getting ready for practice. And I looked at the name on the back of his jersey and it said Breeze. And it's all about the story you tell yourself. It's about the story you want to believe. It's about who you want to be and how you want to accept change and how you want to conquer this world. And I instantly thought about Joe Sanquilito telling me that I had the wind beneath my wings for years. Mm-hmm. I looked at Drew Breeze. I said, hey, man, this is unbelievable. I love you, man. And he looked at me and he goes, thanks. <laughs> I gave him a hug. And I said, you know what, Drew? There's times in life where all of a sudden it just reminds you that it's okay to step out of the wind and catch a breeze, man. You were my breeze. Wow. And it saved my life. And that's what I told myself. So then all of a sudden we get the news that we have to have surgery basically now. 
Uh, my wife and I got a list, and, and I'm going to say this, and, and I hope some of the people out there that reached out to me hear this. There were a lot of coaches from all over the world, from every sport, and I'm going to get choked up just talking about it, mm-hmm. that reached out. And uh, they said, hey, if, if this was our guy, we'd send him here. Here's the surgeon's number. He's expecting your call. Whether it was Major League Baseball, NBA, soccer, whether it was Australian Rules Football, all these teams were reaching out to me. And uh, there was a coach. I'll never forget. I loved him. Mm-hmm. And uh, he was always the hardest coach that I played against. But for some reason, I just didn't think he liked me. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, and it was Coach Quinn at New York. And uh, he sent me a text. And it was the longest text that Coach sent me. And it basically said, hey, man, I loved playing against you every single time. I always knew I was going to get your A game. And you were one of the best competitors that I ever faced. And the game's not going to be the same without you. So if uh, if our guy had this surgery, I talked to the trainers. Here's the surgery we sent him to. And if you need anything, call me. And it was just the ultimate sign of respect that I, mm-hmm. I got choked up, right? And uh, so long story short, um, I remember what Andy Reid said, a coach that I played for. I loved him. I played seven, eight years for him. And I just remember we were losing, and I was sitting on the bus, and he was a few seats in front of me. And he said, if the captain loses his cool, the ship loses his cool. The captain keeps his cool, the ship keeps his cool. So I remember when we found out the news, I said, hey, Ani, we got to keep our cool. Because if the captain keeps his cool, the ship keeps their cool. Mm -hmm. And Ani's your wife. Yeah. And I said, all our family and friends, everybody's going to freak out. So just keep your cool. Let's find the surgeon. Let's do this. And you know what? I never once thought I was going to die. I never once thought I wasn't going to make it out. And that was probably a lifetime of self-talk and and building character. Mm -hmm. Failure wasn't an option. It might ain't going to be easy, but we're coming out the other side. And so sure enough, we, uh, we found a surgeon in Pennsylvania. Uh, Dr. Bavaria at UPenn is the best in the world. Every surgeon we talked to said that he taught them this procedure. And uh, we flew there. Uh, it was an 11 hour surgery. Um, I had a valve replaced and I had the aneurysm removed. And uh, we were in the, we were in the hospital for about three and a half, four weeks post surgery. And so one minute you're you're a professional athlete, right? Doing what you do as an NFL player, and then the next minute you're laying in a hospital bed fighting for your life. What was that like? A lot of things went through my mind, and uh, I think having played 14 years and having accomplished a lot, it was easier to let go because I had been there and done that, right? And mm-hmm. and so all of a sudden, I looked at my wife, and it just kind of dawned on me, okay, either I either have this surgery and live and get to have a family with her and wake up every day, or I, I don't have this surgery and I go play and die. Right. I mean, those, those are your two options. Again, whether you agree with it or not, whether that's what you wanted or not, life doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Those are your options. Yeah, I'll, I'll take living, you know? Right, so sure. when you all of a sudden look at it that way, it's hard to be bitter. But yeah, it was hard. And, and what was really hard, too, is, um, like you said, I was a professional athlete. And now all of a sudden, you know, I, I can't even get up to walk to the door. Right, um, right. I was on 21 pills for a long time. And so mentally I was, uh, there were things about me that weren't the same. And, and, um, if I could go back, you know what, the the one thing I regret selfishly, Mm -hmm. I never stopped to look at it from my wife's perspective Mm. and everything happened so fast and it's not like it was like, okay, we're going to have surgery in four months and you prep for it. Like I found out we were in, but within that, I never once looked at it from her eyes. And how much she would, would, would worry. And, and uh, so when I came out of surgery, I, again, I, I didn't really take time to look at it from her perspective. And um, I wish I would have, because then I probably would have understood a lot more. And, you know, I would fall asleep. Finally, it, it took so long to fall asleep. You know, I didn't sleep in a bed for months. I slept in a recliner. Mm-hmm. And uh, I would fall asleep, and then she'd wake me up. Oh, man, I get so frustrated and angry. And then one day she looks at me, and she's crying, and she goes, I just, I'm scared that you're not going to wake up. I put the mirror under your nose. I try it and I, I don't feel anything. It doesn't steam up. I, oh I just want to make sure you're alive. Right. Wow. And, oh man, oh dude, I just started crying. And so, yeah, it was, it was hard. And, uh, I lost my patience. I would get really angry and frustrated, but here's what happens right in the process. All of a sudden it was dawning on me that I wasn't the same guy I was. My patience wasn't there. I was getting really angry at people, uh, very short fused. And now a lot of it are very common side effects of heart surgery. And a lot of it are very common side effects of all the medication I was on. Mm -hmm. But then you reach this point where you realize that this isn't me. All right, great. Now we're going to get on the road to get me back, get my patients back, Mm -hmm. get just me back. Sure. 
but then all of a sudden you would get in these, these funks and you'd get in these moods and you realize it's not you, but you can't snap out of it. You're still angry. I, I, I punched holes. I yeah. Yeah. I punched holes in kitchen cabinets. I've, I've kicked down doors and I'm alone. Yeah. Like there's no, I'm like, I'm not <laughs> arguing with anybody. I'm not <laughs> mad at anything. It's just like, you just get in this mood where, you know, and then I started realizing that, okay. So now all of a sudden I was on these meds, side effects of open heart surgery. But now all of a sudden the outlet that I had for aggression for over 20 years isn't there. Like I never realized that I was not an aggressive person because I had to save it because every day I was out there to compete for my life, hitting people. Interesting. Well, now I don't have that, but there's still that part of me that loves that aggression competition and like gladiator. Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I was like, Whoa, I need to control that because I don't have that outlet anymore. So what do you do? You just got to bottle it up and just figure out that, you know, don't take it out on anybody or anything. Just learn how to process it differently. And so it, it was definitely a big change. And uh, for people um, that are going through this, buckle up because it's no joke. Yeah, you had to recognize that you had had that outlet. You didn't have it anymore and you had to learn how to manage it. Yeah. And and you know what? We were watching Wentworth, <laughs> which is a Netflix uh, show. On uh, sure. It's great. You know, but I remember there was a scene where they're basically, there was like an addiction thing and the process and all that. And I remember being like, wow, I almost need to treat this like AA, like come to terms with it, realize what it is. And when it happens, acknowledge it mm -hmm. and then figure out how to fix it. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what I did. And so then fast forward, then what was it like watching the Eagles when you're not on the sidelines now, right? Your team for 11 seasons, right? They... Then they go win a Super Bowl. What was that like? And how did you deal with that? And I know there's a really great ending to that story because of the relationships <laughs> you built when you were there. Yeah. It's awesome. Well, you know, at first you're like, are you kidding me? Did this really <laughs> happen? And then, cause then, because now I'm watching the Saints too. They're winning too at the time, right? <laughs> and now it's like, oh my gosh, this might come down to the Eagles Saints in the NFC Championship. I'm like, are you, are you absolutely kidding me? Now, I didn't really watch football uh, that entire season. And the, actually the only game I watched that year was the NFC championship. And we went over to my neighbor's house and he was watching it. And Donnie Jones, uh, went, went to the head coach. He was the punter and one of my best friends in the league. And he went to Doug, jo uh, Doug Peterson. And he said, Hey, if we go to the Super Bowl, we should take going boss. And that was early in the season. He said, heck yeah. The owner said, heck yeah. So they called me and said, Hey, if we win, we're taking you. I was like, okay, I'm on 21 pills. Hang up the phone. Yeah. Long <laughs> shot. We'll see about that. And all of a sudden, they win the NFC Championship. I turn, I look at my wife, and I go, first thing I said is, are you kidding me right now? <laughs> are you kidding me? All this time, I have the most consecutive games ever played as an Eagle, and now they go? It's unbelievable. <laughs> and then, you know what? She looked at me, she smiled, and she said, hey, that would have been cool, but you would have died. Isn't that better to watch? And I said, whoa. Well said. Yeah. So then the team calls, and they say, hey, we're taking you with us. And uh, I remember being in, in, in the owner's box and we were sitting up there watching the game in, in Minnesota. And uh, I remember telling myself, you know what? I always wanted to play in this game. But guess what? Life doesn't really care, right? Things happen. So if all of a sudden this is your, your option, this is it. And, and let me tell you, as many people that thought it was cool that I got a ring, there was that many people that didn't think I deserved it. There was that many people that posted things and said he didn't play. Who cares? He got traded. Get over it. But guess what? My opportunity and my choice, the opportunity I had was, you want to come live it? You can't play in it, but you can experience it or not. And you know what? I took it. And so my wife and I, we went to the game. When, we, when they won, we ran on the field. And I remember just stopping and looking up and I felt the confetti. I always wanted to feel the confetti. Mm. And so her and I got to go up on the platform. We held up the trophy. Jeff Lurie, uh, he said, hey, you're not getting a ring. You're getting a player's ring. And it's for the entire time you spent in this organization. It's for you watching my kids. It's for who you were. It's for holding the most consecutive games ever played as an Eagle. And you helped get us here. And so guess what? I don't care what other people think. You deserve it. And ultimately, it's my decision anyways. So I cried, and, and he gave it to me. And uh, yeah, and, and, and you know what? Says a lot about him. Says a lot about him. Yeah, and, and you know what's cool is, is <laughs> him and I talked, and, and we had a conversation when I was at Lehigh University. We were in training camp when I first got there. And... Uh, we were talking and, uh, you know, I never wanted to get into coaching. So he, you know, I told him, I said, Hey, the only way I'll get a ring is playing. Cause I don't really want to coach. And so sure enough, I'll be darned if the guy's like, Hey man, guess what? I said, what? I remember you told me you were never going to get a ring unless you played because you never wanted to coach. Well, I got something for you. 
you didn't play and you didn't coach, but you got a ring anyways. That's cool. And I just went, whoa. And so, uh, what it stood for, what it meant, um, it was really cool. My wife and I got to experience it and we got to experience it from a, a different perspective than anybody ever will ever again. And, uh, I remember looking at her and looking on the field and all of a sudden the resentment, the bitterness, the anger of, mm. of not being able to play and all that, it went away. And next thing you know, I was rooting for my guy, Nick Foles, my buddy, Darren Sproles, Jason Peters, Brent Selleck, Malcolm Jenkins, all these guys that I played with for a long time, Brandon Graham, friends. Sure. I wanted them to win. Yeah. And I felt like I was there in spirit and it was, it was a really cool experience. It was really cool with the team. It was really cool with the organization. And uh, yeah, so here we are. Well, and you've had amazing moments both as an athlete, as a football player, and, and of course doing, you know, magic on, on, on big stages. But tell me, is the energy the same or different in those moments? And, and how so? You've connected sort of being a long snapper with magic. Does it feel the same inside of those moments? It does, and I'll tell you why. I always want to be a rock star, but I can't sing, I can't play an instrument, <laughs> and I cannot dance. So, boom. But I always wanted the rush of running out of a tunnel in front of 100,000 people. And so ultimately, and I kid you not, this was as simple as this decision was for me. Baseball, eh, probably wasn't going to happen. You know, college is just slow. Nice. But football, <laughs> man, you go play college football, you run out of the tunnel in front of 100,000 people. And one of the main reasons I played college football was I wanted to do that. And so sure enough, my first college game was against Oklahoma, 98,605 people. And I remember running out of that tunnel and I remember being like, Oh man, about 1200 people shy of a hundred thousand, but this is pretty cool. Mm -hmm. But I never let that go. And sure enough, when Dallas built their new stadium, I ran out of a tunnel. Now it was 105,000 people booing, <laughs> but it was pretty <laughs> but cool. But you were running out. I got to run out. Yep. I got to run out of a tunnel with 105,000 people. And when I perform, man, I, I perform just like that. I want to be a rock star. So when people go see my show, I'm going to come out swinging. There's going to be lights. There's going to be music. It's yeah. going to be extremely upbeat. And then every once in a while, I'm going to throw in my ballad. And yeah, we can party. We can have a good time. But guess what? I'm going to hit you with the ballad and the song right that you never heard. Yeah, yeah. And so when I did America's yeah. Got Talent, when you saw me speak, yeah. there's a few moments where I want to show the world that I got skills. And so the cards, that's my guitar. Mm -hmm. And what I say are my words. And the trick is the melody and the riff. And so sure enough, I get to go out with my ballad. I still get to be a rock star, but instead I just use magic. Ugh, and you use it so well. You use it so well to connect. And, and so speaking of magic, you've been on in rock stars, right? You've been on Ellen a few times. So how did that come about? And, and, and what has Ellen meant to you? You seem very connected to her. Tell me about that. So I did America's Got Talent and uh, I had a lot of success, uh, more than I thought I would have. I made it to the finals. And in the finals, I decided instead of coming out swinging and music like I did the previous uh, performances, it was my time to do my ballad. I didn't think anybody expected it, and it was my time, so I did that. And it was a trick. Uh, you saw a version of it that basically uh, says what magic has meant to me and how it saved my life as a kid. And the messaging behind the trick is don't hate, don't blame, and forgive. Mm -hmm. And so Ellen saw it and said, wow, call this guy. So sure enough, I do her show, and... Uh, I, I literally, of all the shows, I've always wanted to be on her show. I love Ellen. I love everything she stands for. Sure. Um, be kind to one another and just be a good person. Mm -hmm. I, I love it. And so I did it, and I said, you know what? I started to watch some clips of other magicians on the show, and uh, I said, you know what? I'm going to come out swinging. <laughs> I'm going to get the energy riled up. <laughs> this is, they're, they're, they're this not is so expect. shocking to hear, John. You were going to come out swinging and get it going. Yeah, right? So, so sure enough, the very first episode I did, man, I brought the energy, and I came out and just uh -huh. owned it. And it, it was such a cool performance. I did a card thing and made a mess. And then this huge spray painting thing. And just, I was, it was so cool. Mm -hmm. So she said, get this guy back. Is that when you did the unwrap in the gift box thing and, and the queen? No, no. So that was way before this. Okay. Got it. Okay. I got did a it. huge thing where we spray paint, we spray painted a Jersey. Okay. And, uh, I was so cool. And so anyways, uh, she said, bring this guy back. And so like a week later I went back and, uh, we just got along, right? And mm -hmm. and you know what? Else? I, I made a decision. Uh, I, I did my ballad for the finals of America's Got Talent. I'm going to do this every time on Ellen now. I'm going to find a way to bring back what I believe and bring back what she believes. And, and just as, a, as an example, there's a trick. There's an envelope or a box. We ask the audience a bunch of questions, and guess what? It's predicted in the box. No way. 
Well, a lot of magicians are like, hey, throw a ball around. Hey, we're going to go to an island. Where do you want to go? Tahiti, awesome. We're going to get a celebrity. Who do you want to go with? George Clooney. Hey, what kind of food? An apple. What do you want to drive? A Ferrari. And then you open the box. Hey, we're going to Tahiti with George Clooney. Eat an apple and a Ferrari. Hey. But like nobody cares, right? Right. And so instead, I do that trick and we threw a ball around. The moment in the studio was so powerful. We threw the ball around. Sure enough, somebody in the audience catches it. I got Ellen on stage uh, in her studio and there's big poster boards. And and I say, hey guys, here's the deal. We got an envelope hanging up. And right now you are standing in front of your hero, Ellen DeGeneres. If you could tell her anything on how she's changed your life or how she makes you feel, there she is, tell her. And now all of a sudden there is this connection, right? Mm -hmm. And then Ellen would write down the answer on how her fans made them feel. Mm. And in the envelope, we predicted it. We predicted how her fans felt about her. And it was the perfect tie-in, right? About what I believe, about what Ellen believes. And then you do a trick where you tear a card up and it changes. It's amazing. And the, and the trick usually ends with the card in pieces. So instead, just add a layer. Hey, Ellen, we can't leave with this card in pieces. And so Ellen picked up the pieces of the card. She held them. And the card restored itself in her hand. So when she opened her hand, hey, Ellen, we leave this show feeling whole. Because that's what you do to us. That's mm-hmm. how you make us feel. Mm-hmm. And now she holds, and then boom, episode ends. So, um, you know, Ellen has given me uh, opportunity. She's believed in me. You know, and, and in, in the entertainment business, Ellen has given me relevancy over time, which has, you know, allowed me to sell out theaters and to perform, do what I love to do. Uh, it's an honor to be a part of not just her life, but her entire crew, the entire show, man. If, uh, everybody is super nice and accommodating. And, and let me tell you, everybody loves working there, but it starts with her. Absolutely. It starts with the culture that Absolutely. she brings. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And you know what's funny? Let's wrap this thing full circle. But it starts with the narrative that you tell yourself. It starts with what you believe in yourself. It starts with what you say about yourself. And Ellen tells herself, be kind to one another. So you know what she does? That's just who she is. And you know what she demands from the people that work for her? The exact same thing. It's the respect that you have. And it's the respect that you demand. So be careful with what you what you have and be careful with what you demand because that's a powerful thing. And if it's the right thing, it's amazing. Well, and, and, and John, what you do so well is you, you know, like you, and I saw you do it live. I've seen you do it on Ellen. You do a trick, but you tie it. And you just did that when you were just sort of sharing. And, and that is one of the coolest things. And I think that's what makes you such a powerful, engaging, entertaining, and effective speaker. Well, thank you. But, but that comes with influence. And what I mean by that is, um, you know, the guy, Kevin Elko, that I told you earlier, who, uh, is a, is a speaker that just resonates with me. And, and when him and I brainstorm, we come up with great stuff and, uh, believe it or not, I took carrot top, Garth Brooks and Mike Tyson. And I saw all three of them. And I said, Oh my gosh, I love everything about all three of these people. Here's what I love about Carrot Top. Here's what I love about Garth. Here's what I love about Tyson. Mm. And so Carrot Top, who's real name is Scott Thompson, who's one of the nicest dudes ever, the use of music throughout his show, I'm, I'm telling you, if you go to Vegas, go to his show. It's hysterical. It's so well produced. Okay. But the use of music clips, the use of music clips, and, and, and yourself, somebody in the speaking circuit, you're going to notice things that maybe a fan wouldn't, right? They notice them, but you're going to process them differently from totally. a production standpoint. Totally. Notice his use of music and the sound bites and the sound clips and how he uses them. It's genius, right? But notice what it does to the audience, right? As a speaker, you go watch a bunch of speakers. If they're on for an hour or 90 minutes, you're trying to find ways to basically get people to move and, 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 and get people to interact, right? Music does that. Music does that effortlessly. You throw on a music clip that people laugh or, or the blood gets going, you've just accomplished that. And you've accomplished that throughout your entire presentation. And that's just one way you can do it. Mm-hmm. Now you find three or four different ways to kind of make it come full circle. Garth Brooks, man, uh, one of the coolest things ever. Uh, I got to become friends with this guy. He was a hero of mine. And uh, when you see Garth Brooks perform, he has so much fun. And it's scripted, but lightly scripted. And he is just, you just want to be him. When you leave his show, you were like, I'm glad it is him because he's so cool. I wanted that. I wanted that. I wanted people to see that, right? I didn't want to be this scripted guy that came out and just like, if something goes wrong, like it's just too scripted, but he's just awesome. And then Mike Tyson, I went and saw the Mike Tyson one man show. If you have not seen it, go see it. It is amazing. The most feared man in the world. I mean, he was literally the most feared man in the world. And he goes up there. And one, it's incredibly self-deprecating, and he literally makes fun of himself the entire time. Mm-hmm. But he's honest. Yeah, he's honest. Yeah, yeah. And you, you know what's funny? 
he admits to doing things when he was younger that you were like, this guy is a scumbag. And how is he admitting it? And why is he admitting it? Is that what you mean? Yeah, but you're like, but why am I like, I, I'm rooting for this guy. Okay. Because you know what? Here's what else I learned. If you try and make everybody happy, nobody likes you. Right? Yep. If you spend so much time worried about what other people think, and that the only reason they're going to like you is because you need to tell them what they want to hear, not the truth, then nobody's going to like you. Mm-hmm. But if you're somebody that just te- says it like it is, whether you agree with me or not, you're going to respect me for telling you how it is. Everybody likes you. So all of a sudden, if you just go up and be vulnerable, like Mike Tyson was, and admit to it and be like, this is who I am. Yeah, I was wrong. But guess what? Here's where I'm going. Wow. Because I can relate to that. Yeah, be real. Everybody be can real. relate to that. Because we're not perfect. Be real. No question. And uh, yeah. So you see these three guys and you grab stuff that, that then you can thread through who is authentically you. And that is some of the ways that you've made your show so entertaining and engaging, and, but yours. And it's a working process, you know. Sure, but, uh, for sure. Yeah, if, if you let the world influence you and you take the good of what you see and then you incorporate it, because you know, when you perform or when you speak, you're, you're, and it makes sense, you're a direct representation of what you are and who you believe, right, and what you believe. Yeah, no question. So I want to convey that. And, and, and now all of a sudden you got to do it from a storyteller's perspective. And, and let me tell you, I've, I've been real fortunate to meet some people recently that saw it that are big time writers and, you know, where they're like, Hey, I think we should do this. And I'm, I'm all for it. I've never had professional help. So, um, but yeah, you, you want to do it in a storytelling way that, that impacts people that they leave. Uh, yeah. Oh, dude, you know what else? Oh man, I can't tell you where I saw this. I can't tell you uh, where I read it. It's not mine, but this quote is beautiful. They're not going to remember what you said. They're not going to remember the lyrics to your song. They're not going to remember the end of the trick. They're not even going to remember what happened on stage, but they're going to remember how you made them feel. And that's, what's going to make them talk about you. And that's, what's going to make them come back. And it is so true and magic. Very, very few people after a show can actually break down a trick the exact way it happened. Most of the time people see a trick and they, when they talk about it, they actually talk about it in a way cooler way than what it really was. (laughs) Right. Like they actually embellish it because that's how they felt. I never really understood why people do wow, that. Wow, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. But then it dawned on me, wow, the way that that guy just described the trick to his friend is way cooler than what I actually did. But you know what he did? He thinks he's being honest. He's not embellishing it. It's what he observed. It's what he remembered. But he's talking about it emotionally on how he felt. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So ultimately, that is exactly how the trick was to him. Sure. I think I did that when I left. I started explaining what you do and how you do it to people, and uh, people were downloading your stuff <laughs> um, because it was so cool. Because I think I probably felt the, the way you're describing that gentleman. So, so John, I, I mean, you're an NFL player, former NFL player, unbelievable success for a long period of time, which you and I both know is hard to do, rare to do, magician, speaker, what what else can we expect from you? And then tell me about this new sort of hard rock casino tour that's coming up. You have and you have a book, all that. Yes. So so you know my uh, for a long time people have been telling me to write this book and uh, it just wasn't the right time. And a buddy of mine was doing a movie called Radio uh, with Cuba Gooding Jr. and Ed Harris. And my buddy's name is Riley Smith. And he had you know was those three had the main three roles. And he goes, oh, you got to meet this guy Mike Tolan. He's producing this movie. Huge Eagles fan. So, you know, years and years ago, I look up Tolan. I'm like, oh, my God, he did Varsity Blues. He did radio. He did Coach Carter. I love this guy. And he's a Philly guy. And I always said, if anybody does a movie on me, I want it to be him. That's what I told myself. If anybody does a movie, I want it to be him. So sure enough, Mike Tolan and I become friends through our mutual friend, Riley Smith. And uh, I go into heart surgery. And all of a sudden, Mike says, hey, have you ever thought about writing a book? I said, yeah, you know, I've, I've interviewed some authors, just haven't found the right one. And he said, I tell you what. There's a gentleman named Larry Platt based out of Philadelphia. He just did Stuart Scott's bestseller. I think he should write your book, and I think he'll capture your voice. And uh, how would you feel if I optioned the rights to do a movie? And I, I got I kind of cried, right, because right. I kept telling myself, right. if anybody's going to do it, Tim. So I met with Simon and & Schuster, and, and Simon and & Schuster picked up the book. Um, we are uh, 13 or 14 chapters in, and it's, oh, man, I'm, I'm reading it. And, and it's a lot like to, to write a book is there's a lot of responsibility there. Right. Sure. And, and I fear that people are going to be bored, <laughs> you know? So I'm reading my own book and I'm like, Oh my gosh, I'm reliving all these things. And it's like, 
it's really good and it reads fast. I love it. Mm-hmm. And so, mm-hmm. uh, Simon and Schuster. And it's a book it. about your life. Is it a book about your life, John? Yeah, yeah. The, the the working title is is Life Is Magic, and it's it's not a sports book. It's not a um, it's not a hey, here's the seven steps to success. Mm-hmm. It's hey, here are the things that happened to me. Here's what I did to get out of it, and here's how I found happiness. Mm. If these help you, rock on. If not. I think you're going to enjoy the story. Nice. And I think that's the elevator pitch. And uh, I've gone through a lot and I've experienced a lot and you know what? I'm happy. And so Tolan picked up the, uh, the rights to the movie. So we're, we're in, we're in the process and uh, it's, it's exciting. When's the book coming out? It's going to be sometime, uh, probably third quarter, 2019. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So the manuscripts due on January 1st. Yeah. I got one due then too, man. It's crunch time for you, bud. Yeah. So what about this hard rock casino tour? Well, we're doing a show at the, uh, uh, the Hollywood, uh, Florida Hard Rock. It's going to be awesome, and then that'll kind of develop from there, and, and we'll see how it goes. So, uh, you know, ever since America's Got Talent and ever since Ellen, uh, it's really, really cool because, you know, when you're a kid as a magician, you always dream of, you know, having a show and touring and the, and the theaters. And, and now we book stuff, and it sells out, and uh, it's really cool. And, you know, one thing I, I take pride on is uh, uh, there was a magician named Lance Burton that performed in Vegas for years and years, and I, I loved him. And he said, you know, one of the hardest things to do in magic is to get people to care. And this brings us back to what we said about the box and you predict about George Clooney going to mm-hmm. TD, mm-hmm. eating an apple and a Ferrari. <laughs> well, all of a sudden you make it relevant, right? Hey, Alan, fans, talk. Here you go. Let's predict it. Cool. I've, I've never had that. I've never had the problem with people caring about what the trick is. And then all of a sudden you start realizing what makes you different. I'm a huge David Copperfield fan. Huge. But you know what? The world already has David Copperfield. Right. And I think there's a lot of magicians out there and you watch them and they're just dying to be him. And it's awkward, right? Mm-hmm. And, but we all go. You gotta there. be you. Yeah. We all mimic, you know, when you get into music, you, you do covers. And, uh, and, and when I was young, I took these guys and I mimicked their routines and, and that's part of learning. But then eventually you have to decipher what makes you, you, uh, there's a movie, uh, a star is born with Bradley Cooper. Who's one of the coolest dudes ever. Huge Eagles fan. Um, but he said something in, in, that, uh, in that movie that literally just resonated. And he looked at Lady Gaga and he says, hey, these people are only going to listen for so long. So you better be careful on what you say, mm. but you better be real with yourself and you better say it. Because your voice and what you have to say, that's what makes you different. No question. And I said, wow. And sure enough, you start reflecting back on my show, right? I, I start reflecting back on my show and that's what's different. I tell my life story and I perform the magic that I learned along the way that helped me find happiness. And then people care. You know what? In 2004, I got booked at the, uh, I think it was called the American Bank Center at the the time. It was in Corpus Christi. I was the keynote speaker. uh, There's 10,000 people in this arena. And one of the stagehands said, hey, that's 10 bucks. You can't get a stand ovation making a coin disappear. (laughs) (laughs) You said, bring it. I got it. Yeah. And then all of a sudden I said, boom. All right. And that was kind of a defining moment in my career where I did just that. And eventually I, 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 I built it up and then we made the coin disappear and people went absolutely nuts. Sure. And I remember thinking one, thank you. Two, I want my 10 bucks. And three, <laughs> it's not about the trick. It's not. Mm-hmm. It's about them caring about the trick. Mm-hmm. You can get a stand ovation making a coin disappear. Cause I've been to shows where a magician does something and I'll look around and be like, dude, that was amazing. I, I really have no idea how he just did that. And he's getting a golf clap. Like, are, are you serious right now? Like, that was, I'm going nuts. But people are like, yeah, that was cool. What's next? I'm like, whoa. But guess what? They didn't really emotionally care. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They weren't invested. Mm-hmm. People can tell. Yeah. Totally. Heck people yeah, they can, can tell. Yeah. And guess what? And then it comes back to this. They're not going to remember what you did, but they're going to remember how you made them feel. Mm-hmm. And that's what's going to make them come back. Okay, so John, you've been so generous with your time. We end with a rapid fire, so I'm going to fire up some questions to you. You operate pretty fast, I can tell. So um, you just fire back what comes up for you, all right? <laughs> okay. You ready, man? I'm in. Okay, one word. To- are, hey, no, no. The, the question is, are you ready? Am I ready, baby? <laughs> I was born ready. Okay, one word to describe yourself. Happy. One word others would use to describe you. Oh, gosh. I don't even want to open that door. Um, what about your wife? What would she say? Determined. Nice. Nickname? Magic Man. Favorite magic trick? 
David Copperfield, man, he bought, he had a little baby shoe. It was the shoe he wore as a little kid. He puts it in his back pocket. He turns back around. He borrows any ring. His hands never leave the front of his body. The ring disappears right in his hand, and he turns around, and that borrowed finger ring is tied into the laces of his baby shoe in his back pocket. Holy Favorite trick of all time. Whoa. And for people out there, yeah, uh, Google David Copperfield, baby shoe, 1993 Fires of Passion Tour. It comes up. Okay, sweet. I'm on it. Who is the funniest teammate of all time? Oh, there's so many. I know, I right? Mean, Chris it, Long's hilarious. Okay. Lane Johnson. Oh, man. Uh, Jason Kelsey. Funniest teammate of all time? Yeah. Oh. I mean, I thought Bobby Shaw was funny. I, I actually think Jason Kelsey's a pretty funny dude. He's okay. the center for the Eagles. Yeah, yeah, he yeah. makes me laugh. Okay. What's the last book you read? I read a lot of magic stuff. Um, uh, the, the last book I read was probably Wiz Mob, uh, The Technical Argot and Behavior Patterns of Pickpockets. And it was referred to me by Apollo Robbins. Interesting. I got into pickpocketing. Yeah, I got into pickpocket years ago. And I wanted to do it on stage in theater and in comedy. And uh, he said, read this book. And and Theatrical Pickpocketing by Jim Ravel. Uh, yeah, that was a great one. Uh, Mark Raffles has a pickpocketing book. So those are the most recent ones I've reading. But it's really understanding the psychology and, you know, Wiz Mob, uh, the, the, the Argot, which is language of how uh, street pickpockets work and and you know there's five members and you have the grifter and, and the spotter and all these people that kind of make the team interesting and so that was an interesting book yeah yeah wow so you read a lot of books that help you with what you do yeah i wouldn't say i read a lot of books okay um but i, I watch a lot you know, yep. you know today is so much more of a mm-hmm. visual and, and like i and, and if we remember earlier my reading comprehension is not very good mm-hmm. so like it takes me a, like i'll read a page over and over and over but if I watch something and I hear it and I feel it, I never forget it. Got it. Okay. What's one thing on your bucket list? You know what? It's crazy. And, and, and I'm going to go kind of materialistic and career driven here. Uh, well, I'll, I'll give you two, two okay. things. Okay. Uh, one, I always thought I'd get an Academy Award for Best Supporting Actor. Nice. I don't know why. Okay. That'd be pretty cool. Yeah. I don't need Best Actor, but I think just being Best Supporting, which ironically is what a long snapper is. You're a supporting character, right? And yeah, so yeah. I just always thought I'd, I'd get an Academy. So anybody out there, let, 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 hey, let's do this. Cast me, I'll, 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 I'll kill it for You're you. You're in. Yeah, the other thing is, is um, you know, I, I fly uh, a plane and uh, since I've had uh, three wrist surgeries and my heart surgery, I haven't have been able to fly in like over two years. And uh, I never want to walk through an airport ever again. <laughs> As you know, I mean, I travel, you know, we did a million miles in a few months. Mm-hmm. And uh, mm-hmm. my goal you know, I got a buddy that owns a global 5,000, and it's basically a, it's, it's an apartment in the sky. Sure. God, you know what's Sweet. on my bucket list? I would love, I would love to own my own plane like that, and every time my wife and our family and our dog travel, just never go through TSA and delays and all that, so. <laughs> hey, I know, man, I'm I with you on that one. I know it's not the sentimental one, but yeah, it's not the sentimental bucket list, but I'm going to, I'm going to go selfish here and say, I want my own plane, and I never want to walk that airport ever again. <laughs> what is your most memorable career moment so far? I'll tell you right now. I have two. Um, I was playing the Giants, and, uh, well, the week before, we were in Arizona, and uh, I tore three ligaments in my ankle in the fourth quarter, and uh, we finished the game, and the doctor said, you're out eight weeks, and uh, Andy Reid came to me and said, hey, what's the deal? I said, coach, I'm playing unless you tell me otherwise. And so sure enough, uh, I, I, sle- I slept at the facility all week. Um, if I didn't play, then they were going to put me on, uh, well, they were going to keep me on the roster and they'd have to fire somebody to bring in another snapper to fill in for me. Mm-hmm. So sure enough, I played. And I wrapped it up. And Coach wow. Quinn, who was, iron- hey, who was ironically the coach that I just never thought really liked me, who ended up sending me a text. Him and three doctors followed me around in pregame to see if I'd limp. And sure enough, I didn't limp. And it hurt like crazy. So Coach Cully comes up to me before the game. He says, hey, John, just snap the ball and get off the field. I say, Coach Cully, I'm going to tell you right now. Not only am I going to snap the game winner to win this game, but I'm going to go down and make a solo tackle just for you. So what happens? The first punt. I snap it. Yeah, the snap was a little bit off to the right, but hey, I was one-footed. And I ran down, and I made a solo tackle. Oh my and then gosh. with about a minute and 30 left, we're down by one or two. And sure enough, we go out to kick a field goal to give us a two-point lead. We end up winning the game by two. So guess what? I end up running down, making a solo tackle. That's insane. And I end up snapping a game one field insane. goal. That's insane. That's awesome. All of it on one foot. But here's the moment. This is the moment that was one of the most best accomplishments I ever had. I'm in the training room after the game. We unwrap it, and it just balloons up. I mean, it hurts so bad. Mm-hmm. Andy Reid came by. Didn't even say a word. 
He looked at me, tapped me on my other leg, and he just gave me the head nod. He just nodded his head and kept walking. Mm. And that head nod, that head nod in sports is what you play for. It's when somebody looks at you and says, I know what you went through, I know what you did, and I know how bad you hurt. And gosh dang it, man, you got it done. I can count on you. Mm. That's what that head nod, that's what it means. Mm -hmm. And then the other one, the other one was uh, a little while ago, we did a show at the uh, State Theater in uh, Pennsylvania. And it was my first official, beautiful theater. First time I sold tickets and it sold out. And the next night we went to Lancaster at the American Music Center. And we sold out two nights in a row. And those were the first two uh, like public shows I did in a beautiful theater. And we rocked it. And uh, that was a huge accomplishment for That's incredible. Absolutely dad. it is. Yeah. A 12-year-old kid that's shuffling cards in his room and one day dreams. And here's the other part. I said, I want this picture. We had a photographer. I said, I want this picture. And I always dreamed as a kid to be in a beautiful theater and have the halo lighting over top of me. Sitting and shuffling cards at a table with a sold-out theater of people that care. Mm. And so sure enough, I have a picture in both theaters. Shuffling cards at a card table with halo lighting with a theater full of people that care. God. Man, that was cool. It's the story you tell yourself. There yeah. it is. That's it. You know? Who's a person you'd want to play you in a movie? Chris Pratt would kill it. Chris Pratt, if you're out there, okay. you're my guy. He's your guy. But you know what's funny? When you first started asking that question, I yeah. thought it was going to be the person that you'd most want to play with. Ah, well, what's that answer? Uh, completely random, but oh my gosh, to line up next to King Griffey Jr., put him in center field, me in right field. Oh, play catch between innings. That would have been sick. <laughs> <laughs> That's good stuff. Okay, so the show's called Game Changers. So one last question. What Game Changer inspires you and why? My wife. Nice. And I'll tell why? You why? Yeah, tell I'll us tell why. why. Well, my mom died. I've bit my nails ever since. And I was married, divorced, happily divorced, thank God. And then when I met my wife, I was a professional athlete, flying my own plane, performing, didn't want to be involved with anyone. And we met. And she changed my life. She turned my heart right side up. Mm. And then there were some things about me that I still didn't really like. And uh, those aspects of my life all got better. And I'll be darned. I kid you not. I tried everything. I even tried that stuff you coat your nails with that tastes really bad. I tried everything to stop biting my nails. And then sure enough, um, I spent time with my wife and we were dating. And I looked down and I don't bite my nails no more. Oh, my gosh. Wow. Wow. And so um, I love my wife. I love everything she stands for. I love the way she treats people. I love how she's loved me unconditionally. Um, and I love the man I am today because of being able to hang out with her. And I'm sure it's a little bit more than stopping you from biting your nails, right, John? Oh, it's, it's, it's everything. She's, she's had such a great, great impact. In how long life. have you guys been married? Uh, we've been married a year and a half now. Okay. So we, we basically, we met over the phone through a mutual friend, uh, wanted nothing to do with each other. So they were like, oh, yeah, I'm going to hook you up, John. Great, what is she? Six foot blonde from Vegas. Oh, okay, here we go. And then, hey, John, hey, Annalise, guess what? We got this guy we want to hook you up with. Oh, great, what is he? Oh, he, he plays for the Philadelphia Eagles. He's a professional athlete. Yeah, I want nothing to do with him. <laughs> so that was like our <laughs> first impression, right? Okay. And then sure enough, uh, we we, uh, we talked on the phone for four months, and then which was great because, you know, there was nothing physical, right? Sure. I mean, we're literally we enjoying connect. each other's laughter and, and talking. So we went out to dinner and then, uh, after our first date, we spent three days together and she moved in the rest is history. Mm. And you've been together almost four years now. Yeah. That's outstanding. John, you are a gift to so many. I mean, the impact that you've had, the way you've recovered from so many incredible challenges, huge challenges, life changing moments is so powerful. I know our listeners are going to get so much on the way that you think, the way you recover, the way you behave the way you talk to yourself in hopes that others can, can do the same in their own lives. So thank you for who you are and for the impact you make on other people's lives. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me. Thanks, as always, for listening to Game Changers with Molly Fletcher. If you like the show, be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts. There you can listen to previous episodes and leave us a review, which helps other people find out about the show. For more about me, visit mollyfletcher.com. Until next time, stay curious and be bold.